Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a chapter-by-chapter -chapter read-through of J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Being done a little bit bass backwards here. I did, I did, our, we went our way through the Two Towers and the Return of the King. Now we're returning to the Fellowship of the Ring to finish up at the beginning. <laughs> and we have followed our heroes, four hobbits, as they make their way out of the Shire, bearing... The greatest burden of them all, the one ring, <laughs> the one, the, the, the ruling ring of the Dark Lord Sauron, which is at long last come to light again. And which, if it's regained by the Dark Lord, would mean endless darkness without a dawn for all of Middle-earth. Most of the great powers and the wise in Middle-earth have no idea that the ring has been recovered, much less that it's in the hands of a completely defenseless quartet of little heroes. Uh, but... They have made the decision to leave the Shire and bring the ring to Rivendell, a citadel of the elves in Middle-earth. It's a provisional plan, anyway, a sketchy plan. The main goal they have is to, get, is to get out of the Shire, to get out of the neighborhood safely, because they are being pursued by riders in black. Uh, and the ring, keep in mind, wants to be found. Whenever a rider gets near Frodo, the hobbit who is bearing the ring, feels an almost irresistible urge to put it on his finger. When you put the ring on, it turns you invisible, and it makes you immediately visible to the Nazgul, to these riders in black who have long since fallen under the shadow of the Dark Lord because of the rings of power they wear themselves. So Frodo is carrying the ring, but he's not using it, because to put it on would immediately make him visible to the very forces he's trying to hide from. Uh, and... Our hobbits have encountered a couple of friends and uh, a couple of close calls with these black riders, and they have decided to try unconventional methods of travel in order to get to the nearest big river, the nearest ferry, in order to get to the nearest town. And one of those shortcuts is for them to go through the old forest, a very, very old, crowded wood full of trees that talk to each other and move around and don't like non-trees at all. They don't like bipeds whatsoever. I've mentioned, just in passing, that they have a reason to dislike hobbits, because hobbits cut down hundreds of them and burn them. But it doesn't deter our heroes. They are, they are dead set on traveling through the old forest, hoping that since the ground is covered in little brooks and tussocks and tangled roots, that riders on horseback won't follow them in. Little do they guess, or maybe they don't expect it as much as they should, that the old forest has dangers of its own. The trees don't like people that go on feet at all, and proceed to try to eat two of the young hobbits. Merry and Pippin find themselves almost eaten by one of the trees. Sam and Frodo are frantic. They have no ability. This is an old, iron-hard, gnarled tree. They have no ability to do anything about it. So they seek help from a stranger who is wandering by. A very strange stranger. There is no stranger. Stranger. <laughs> they seek help from a character called Tom Bombadil, who is bigger than a hobbit, but smaller than a big person, smaller than a human or an elf. Doesn't appear to be a dwarf. Doesn't appear to be anything. It appears to be solely himself. He walks over to the tree and tells it to knock it off. Basically, he basically talks to the tree and orders it to spit out the two hobbits and says, to cap off his argument, Bombadil is speaking. And the tree instantly does. The hobbits are just fine, and Bombadil invites them to his house for supper and then proceeds on his path in such a careless way that you get the impression that he wouldn't care whether they follow him or not, but they do. They do follow him, and they get to his house. A house that seems almost as much wilderness as building. They meet Goldberry, his, his, the lady of the house, who seems just as supernatural as he is. Uh, and that leads us to the next chapter, chapter 7 of this book, which is one of the most famous chapters, one of the most talked about chapters, one of the most debated chapters in the whole of The Lord of the Rings. The chapter is called In the House of Tom Bombadil. Uh, and it, it, in it, the hobbits rest. They rest in Tom Bombadil's house, where the beds are soft as downs, and the covers are warm and comforting, and the fire is always just right, and the rain might be falling outside, but it sounds wonderful, and the smells and greenery of a fresh garden and summer 
permeate the whole place. It is paradise. It is paradise. And eventually they start to talk to their host. And Tom Bombadil starts to tell them stories. At first they're a little surprised. He seems to to esteem Farther, Farmer Maggot, a character that we've met in an earlier chapter, a little bit more highly than they do, or than any hobbit they know does. He seems to like Farmer Maggot. But the more Tom Bombadil talks, the further back in time his stories go. Until they start going back further and further in time than the hobbits have ever even dreamt about. And they don't sound like stories. They sound like memories. I want to read you these, these bits and pieces from this chapter have been read a million times by a million people. But I can't resist. <laughs> I can't resist. Uh, so I want, to, uh, I want to read some of them to you as well. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, when they caught his words again, they found that he was now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore. And still on and back Tom went, singing out into the ancient starlight when only elves were awake. Then suddenly he stopped, and they saw as he, that, that he nodded as if he were falling asleep. The hobbit still sat before him, enchanted, and seemed as if, under the spell of his words, the wind had gone, the clouds had dried up, and the day had been withdrawn, and darkness had come from the west, from the east and west, and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. Whether the morning or evening of one day or many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. The stars shone through the window, and the silence of heaven seemed to be round him. He spoke at last out of his wonder and a sudden fear of that silence. Who are you, master? he asked. Eh, what? said Tom, sitting up, his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, yourself, alone and nameless? But who are you, young? But you are young and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the rivers and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow lights. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from outside. What on earth? What on earth have our heroes stumbled into? Who on earth is this? You, some readers might, remind, might be reminded uh, of a similar pattern in The Hobbit, where the hobbits meet a man who is going to turn out to be a kind of a werebear. This is nothing like that. This is orders of magnitude greater. Uh, Goldberry interrupts them and, and tells them that supper is ready and that the rain has stopped and whatnot. And after supper, it's time uh, for more stories. It's time for more talk. Uh, and Tom continues to talk. He talks about Farmer Maggot and how he esteems him. But after a while, uh, he calls for Frodo to show him the ring. Frodo has been reluctant. Bilbo, we saw before him, was reluctant even to show the ring, much less to share it. But Frodo, to his amazement, finds that not only is he willing to show the ring to Tom Bombadil, but he's willing to hand it to him. <laughs> he puts the, hand, the ring in his hand. Uh, Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment in his big, brown-skinned hand. Then suddenly he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second, the hobbits had a vision of both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through the circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring around the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this, but then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air, and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry, and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously, like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring, or looked the same and weighed the same, for that ring has always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a, a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity, and then, when the talk was going again, and Tom was telling an absurd story about badgers and their queer ways, he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start, and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted, in a way. It was his own ring, after all, for Mary was staring blankly at his chair, 
and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept quietly away from the fireside towards the outer door. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with a most seeing look in his shining eye. Come, Frodo, come here. Where you be a-going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring. Your hand's more fair without it. Come back, leave your game, and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Uh, Frodo takes the ring off, comes and sits down by the fire, and they have the rest of a fine evening until the hobbits go to bed, tired and happy. <laughs> and believe it or not, we're going to see a little more of Tom Bombadil, but believe it or not, Tolkien never actually explains anything in this chapter. I have heard so much about In the House of Tom Bombadil. In my lifetime, I have heard so much and read so much about who Tom Bombadil is, about what he can possibly mean, where he fits in the legendarium of Middle-earth. We see in this chapter a few things. Tom is not just telling stories about being in Middle-earth before the elves arrive before the world is bent, before the fall of Numenor, before the turning of the seas, before anything. He is clearly not telling stories about that. There's no one to tell those stories. He clearly remembers it. He says to them, I was here. Before the first raindrop, before the first acorn, I was here. I'm the oldest. I'm eldest. And not only does he say that, anybody could say that, but the ring doesn't make him disappear. And he can see someone who's wearing it. Nothing in the book prepares us for anything like this. Nothing like this occurs again in the book. There is no parallel for Tom Bombadil, nor is there any explanation for him. His name is going to come up again. He's not the last we're going to see him. We're going to see him next chapter. But his name comes up again in the greatest chapter in The Fellowship of the Ring called The Council of Elrond. And we learn in that, in that chapter that the elves know him quite well. Elrond says that I remember him from ages ago, and even then he was older than anyone, if it is the same person. And it is debated in that debate. Well, okay, if Frodo's story is true, then, then shouldn't we give the ring to him? He seems to have a power over it. Gandalf has to correct them and say, no, better to say it has no power over him. Within his own lands, he is master. It's a word that Goldberry and Tom Bombadil both use in describing him. But what does it mean? <laughs> we don't know. Tolkien fans simply have to make their peace with that. They make, they make plenty of theories on the subject. There's plenty of hypothesizing about who or what Tom Bombadil is, especially since the text contains a contradiction. Gandalf is sitting there at the Council of Elrond when, uh, when Elrond says that Ear ben Adar, that this Orald, this old figure that from eons past was even then the oldest of the olds. Gandalf sits there in silence. He says nothing about it. He doesn't contradict it. And yet Gandalf himself tells our characters that Treebeard, the Ent, is the oldest living thing still walking under the sun in Middle-earth. That seems like a contradiction. If Tom Bombadil was in Middle-earth before the first acorn, then he was certainly there before the first Ent. So, <laughs> you would think that if Tolkien raises these questions, he would answer them, and he does not. He does not. Tom Bombadil is an enigma, plain and simple. The author does not unravel him for the reader, which means that typically when people are dramatizing this story, they leave him out. They just wholesale leave him out. He doesn't actually affect the plot any. So it makes sense, for instance, that Peter Jackson would leave him out. I know a lot of fans at the time, 30 years ago, who were very upset by that. They wanted to see a Tom Bombadil on the big screen. But what do you do with him? So there's a character out there who seems to be completely aside from the magic of Middle-earth, older than the magic of Middle-earth. The ring has no power over this character at all, but he is himself disinterested in the ring. He doesn't want it, and he wouldn't protect it, and he couldn't protect it. When the idea float is floated at the Council of Elrond to give the ring to Bombadil to protect, Gandalf says he'd be a careless guardian, and that that ought to be reason enough not to give it to him. That he wouldn't know how important it was, nor would he keep it. He would lose it. And it's also pointed out that 
even if he did keep it, if all the powers of Middle-earth, if all the powers of the Dark Lord Sauron were turned against him, he would fall, last as he was first. But that's it. Other than at the very end of the book, at the very end when we're all done, Gandalf says that he intends to spend, once the, the whole story is over, he says he intends to spend a good deal of time talking with Tom Bombadil, who is a moss gatherer. He has stayed in one place and gathered moss, whereas Gandalf has been condemned to constantly roam. Uh, that, that is not an explanation. That is not even context, and that's all we get. That's all we get. Tom Bombadil cannot be dismayed in the little realm that he has staked out for himself with boundaries that no one but him can see. He cannot be dismayed, and no power can contradict him, not even the ring. Uh, which... I might point out here, the power of the ring is the power of command. But not to Tom Bombadil. His is also the power of command. And it supersedes the ring, which he is much, much older than the ring. He's apparently much, much older than almost anything. You just have to make your peace with it. If you're reading this for the first time and you get to this character, you are naturally going to think, trained as you are by later fantasies, where nothing is left like this, where there, is no, there are no enigmas, you're going to read this chapter if you're reading this book for the first time, and you're going to think, okay, well, this is going to become very important later on. Obviously, a character who isn't affected by the ring is going to play a huge role in this story. Nope. If you're not, if you don't have those hopes, you might read this chapter and think, okay, well, even if this character doesn't play a huge role in the story, he's still going to play a huge role in the exposition when it's finally revealed what Tom Bombadil is. Nope. <laughs> nope. You just have to make your peace with it. That's all. He is a mystery. An enchantingly done mystery. I never fail to read this chapter with love. I absolutely love it. And the next chapter. Uh, so <laughs> we're going we're gonna to finish here for now. I wish I could give you definitive answers about the chapter in the House of Tom Bombadil, but I can't. <laughs> so we're going to finish this chapter. We'll move on to the next one. We're going to see a little bit more of Tom. Uh, and I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.